this is the mineral axonite. There are actually four different minerals in the the group of axonite minerals. This is the iron rich variety. Um, actually, if you buy axonite and it's only labeled axonite and isn't given any other uh, modifiers, then it's most likely the iron variety. Most likely, not always, but most likely. Typically, if it's not the iron variety, usually they'll they'll label it with the modifier uh, manganese or magnesium or the name tinzonite, which is an intermediate iron manganese variety. Uh, I'm going to go into those chemical formulas here in just a moment. Here's the mineral uh, axonite. So calcium manganese, this is one of the formulas. The one for this particular mineral is actually iron instead of manganese. So where you see that MN2+, plus, you would actually replace it with the Fe2+, plus instead. So it's the same charge and the same relative size such that that can actually be replaced with iron. I don't know how complete the solid solution series is between the iron, manganese, and magnesium varieties and the tinzonite variety. Um, but there definitely is some replacement. Um, I think there's also some chromium and vanadium that can, that might've actually been a different mineral. No, no, no. That's a different mineral I was reading about earlier that I'm actually going to talk about tonight, but we'll, we'll move on from that in a moment. So again, mineral in question that you're looking at is called axonite. Okay. Now there's boron in this. It's actually a borate or a uh, borosilicate is, is what it's considered in, in some locali not some localities, but by uh, different classification schemes. So this is actually considered a borosilicate because of the boron present in the, in the element. Oh yeah, there's a lot of oxygen. Honestly, Garg, <laughs> Greg, there are most minerals, if not, so many minerals have some amount of oxygen in them. Not all of them. So the oxides are obviously going to, because in it's inherent within their name, they oxidize, or oxides, right? Um, the silicates are all going to have oxygen because all of the silicates are based on the silicon tetrahedra, uh, or the silica tetrahedra, which is uh, a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygen that literally produces a little tetrahedra. That's the basic building block for all of the silicates. And if you recall from previous lectures, the silicates are the biggest group chemically of minerals. I'll say that again. The silicates are the biggest group chemically of minerals. And this is a borosilicate. Yes. And minerals, they're not magical geometries. They actually have chemistry behind their reasoning. The reason they're shaped the way they are is all, it all comes down to chemistry. All right. So, again, axonite, uh, this is the iron end member. So, although there is manganese in this particular formula, I will show you momentarily that there are actually four different formulas for the four axonite varieties. This is the ferro axonite or the iron end member. You'll also notice that these individual crystals are relatively shiny, and you can even see striations on uh, one of these blades here. They're considered bladed because of the shape, so they're very, very thin. They literally almost look like knife blades. That's actually where it gets its name from. Axina, I think, is the Greek word in which it got its name from, I believe. Yeah, axina means axe in uh, Greek. And that is where it actually gets its name. It was found by a French mineralogist in 1797, René Just Huy, or something like that. I can't pronounce his last name. But uh, yeah, this mineral was discovered in 1797. The luster you see is vitreous, so that has to do with the light reflecting off of the mineral plane. And its color is one of the last things you're really going to use to identify most minerals. And uh, this one is almost a plum brown. The colors of the axonite are actually kind of uh, unique in the, in that they're not just, they're not a typical brown that I've seen in uh, a lot of metallic minerals. But uh, again, this is a silicate. So silicates are going to look a lot different on top of all that. There are two good cleavage planes and one poor cleavage plane in this mineral. Again, the hardness ranges from six to seven, depending on the crystallographic axes on which you're looking upon. It can be brown, plum, blue, lavender brown. It can actually even be yellow or pearl gray, greenish. Um, I'll actually go over the various colors that each 
chemical group can produce. The, it can fracture irregularly, unevenly, and even concoidally, like quartz. The refractive index is anywhere from 1.7 to 1.74. In fact, it ranges again with the differences in chemical composition of the mineral. The diaphaneity, that has to do with how transparent or not that mineral is. Is it opaque or can you see through it? It's actually somewhat transparent or translucent. So at the thinnest, if you were to cut this on a very, very, very thin scale, let's say 15 microns, which is usually typical for a thin section when you would use for microscopy, right? So those would be absolutely translucent. You would be able to see through them. They might be slightly colored. And even in thin section, there's actually very strong pleochroism. So that means if you were to rotate this and it's thin enough, you can see a change of color when you rotate it a certain amount of degrees. Usually it's about 90 degrees. You should be able to see a different color. And that's because you're rotating the axis or the direction or the orientation from which you're looking. And different minerals can have different colors along different axes. Pleochroism is a very, very common property in minerals, one in which geologists use to identify them regularly. Yeah, a great brown. It's, it's like a real weird purpley grayish grape brown. Yeah, this, this sample is really, really nice. In fact, this, I, there was a sample on Mindat. No, 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 no. E-Rocks that I really wanted and I was outbid once. It's the whole reason I found out about this mineral. And I, I, the reason I became obsessed was because of the pleochroism. The sample there on the site was thin enough that and transparent enough that I thought I could probably see some uh, pleochroism. This one is a bit opaque. Not opaque, but more translucent. I'm sorry, trans, translucent. Yeah, it's not so transparent as the other one. But the shape of these particular crystals are, I think, much better developed they're really really pointed the luster's really well developed the striations on some of the crystal faces are great there's even a bit of twinning between some of the the crystals i, I absolutely adore this sample and then you get the massive uh look of it on the back side so you can you can see some more shapeless formations if that makes sense so nice well-developed crystal faces up here and a more massive structure here on the bottom. So you get two different habits in this in this cluster. There might actually be some other mineralization here or other kinds of minerals here on the bottom. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's kind of more like a dagger, yeah. It's very brittle, jalopy. Um, a lot of the silicates are brittle, like quartz. Um, and this one fractures unevenly. It can fracture like quartz and then it fractures sometimes concoidally, but not all the time. The system then, the, the shape uh, the, of the six crystal systems. This one occurs in the triclinic system. It is a borosilicate that has to do with the chemical classification system in which it occurs. It can occur in igneous rocks as well as metamorphic rocks. The metamorphics that this mineral typically is found in is low temperature uh, metamorphics as well as mafic igneous rocks. So those are the two types of rocks that you can typically find this one in. This mineral is actually found worldwide um it, despite the fact that it actually there was nothing on it in my mineralogy book so it's a bit sad on that but i found a lot more information elsewhere um but the mineralogy book really does describe some of the best examples of each of the classification systems so that's really the point of it is to teach that not obscure minerals right i'm trying to see we went over okay so they're tabular wedge-shaped minerals um you can actually find these in gemstones. I was pretty surprised to see her that, especially as bladed as they are. I mean, that and the hardness is a little bit different, but it's not as bad as the difference in hardness on kyanite. So I suppose gemologists shouldn't hate this one like they would kyanite. Because kyanite's difference in hardness is almost three. Uh, in one direction, it's, I think, four and a half. And the other direction perpendicular to that one is seven. So we've got ferroaxonite as the iron end member. Magnesioaxonite for the, the magnesium end member. Ma manganaxite. Manganaxite for the manganese end member. And tinsonite for an in-between or an intermediate end member that's got some iron and some manganese. And that one is yellow, brownish, and yellow green. That one's kind of a weird one in terms of its color. Oh, this was an interesting um something I found on I don't remember where I found this on a website, but you can apparently contain girthite fibers or geothite, however you want to pronounce it. And I'm wondering if you can get anything like a steerism 
in some rare cases because although this is no, you wouldn't be able to because it's not a hexagonal mineral. You're only going to get that in hexagonal shaped minerals. Never mind. But I wonder if there's anything in here with girthite inclusions that make it look somewhat like uh, rutilated quartz, for example. No, no, no. Girthite spelled like this. Geothite. Uh, geothite. That's how it's spelled. I don't know why it's pronounced that way, but it is. In fact, I'm curious. How the hell is it pronounced? That's how my professors used to pronounce it was girthite. Gothite. Gothite. So it's not girthite. It's gothite. That makes way more sense because there's not an R in that word. Gothite. So now I know forever. Girthite. I think maybe he just had an accent. I don't know. I think that's all of the major things that I wanted to talk to you about axonite, but I do want to show you the various formulas just so you can see them because it helps. That's how I, I'm a very visual learner. It helps me. So you've got the axonite group here. Um, so tinzonite is one of them. This is the ferroaxonite. This is the manganoaxonite. Do they have the manganese, Freddy? Yeah. No, the manganese and then the magnesium. Mg is magnesium. Mn is mag manganese. All right. So tinzite is not the variety that I have. This almost kind of looks like barite a little bit. It's very, very pretty. But calcium, manganese, aluminum, boron, silica, oxygen, and hydroxyl. Silicate, or sorosilicate in this case. No, this one, okay, axonite is a silicate. There's boron in it, but I actually think that I was mistaken in calling this one a borosilicate. That or it was listed as a borosilicate somewhere. Yeah, this one's a silicate. So the iron end member is a silicate. I'm mistaken. It's not a borosilicate. Please, uh, please ignore that. Although in one reference it is a borosilicate. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look into this to to really to determine that. So uh for now it's we'll just we'll just fit it in with the silicates because it is it is a silicate. A borosilicate is a more specific kind of silicate. Anyway, this is the uh iron end member. And you can see that in the uh cation spot where magnesium was, now iron is. Now we've got manganese where iron and magnesium were. And this is the, uh, so this is the magnesium variety. It's very, very nice, that lavender purple though. And you can see those yellow varieties that can be produced. And this is the, uh, the variety that I have. It looks, uh, it doesn't look as translucent and nice as these ones, um, or as red as that, but it looks kind of, uh, kind of more like this plum brown in this sample here that you can see. There might even be a bit of, I don't know how much magnesium and manganese can uh, replace. I don't know how much of a solid solution series there is between these three minerals. That's another thing is I don't remember what uh, pentacoidal means or the class H through M in crystallography. So that's something I'm going to have to reteach myself. I just don't remember. It's been too many years. That's fine. Plated crystals. Oh, yeah, that can be also compact and granular. We've got both of those in my sample. Look at that. We've got the compact granular massive formation down here and then the nice bladed crystals at the top. This is such a good sample. That's very pretty. Very pretty vitreous luster. It's nice and shiny. God, this is so cool. These little blades. They've got nice striations, too. I love how minerals can just grow into these perfect geometries. It's insanity. Earth produces the best, the best art. 